Welcome to my world. Two escargot, pate, frise, two green salads. Okay, man, it's not here. Lamb chop, steak frites. Shouldn't you be doing something? Two faux filet and a pepper steak. Come on, make the dessert. Chocolate tart, please. As a cook, tastes and smells are my memories. And now I'm in search of new ones. So I'm leaving New York City and hope to have a few epiphanies around the world. And I'm willing to go to some lengths to do that. I am looking for extremes of emotion and experience. I'll try anything. I'll risk everything. I have nothing to lose. Los Angeles, Los Angeles, why, God, why am I here? I'm the worst possible guy in the world to do, you know, a Los Angeles Adventures in Food show. I'm an East Coast sort of a guy. I'm a bundle of deeply held prejudices, morbid fears, and apprehension about this town. Have palm trees ever looked more menacing, more sinister? This is where bad things happen to people like me. My worst nightmare about going to L.A that I do not have the strength of character to survive there. It's where people way more talented than I go and screw up their lives completely. First, I start believing the compliments. Then, my agent will give me some compromising offer to write a very special episode of Dharma and Greg. And it'll sound pretty good. <laughs> Finally, I'll take my TV money and settle into some fancy Hollywood hotel then I really start to screw up. Next thing you know, I'm coughing up my last on a cold bathroom floor, or I wind up face down in the hotel pool. And the message is always, you shouldn't be messing around out here. So what's the first thing I do when I get to Los Angeles? I rent a classic 67 or 68 red Mustang convertible. I like it. I like it a lot. Oh, yeah. Styling. It begins. Corruption in increments. While I'm in this town, I want to see what the locals are really eating. Is it really all avocados and light cooking and non-smoking zones and no animal fat? I want to get my hands dirty. I want to eat everyday chow. And the first thing I notice is there seems to be a remarkable number of fast food restaurants out here. For now, I'm looking to ease into the California thing. I'm on a hot dog quest. I just want a dog like I know and love. I mean, what unifies us in America more than the beloved hot dog? How is the California, particularly the Southern California hot dog, different than the New York hot dog? It's different. We are now approaching the fine gourmet emporium, tail of the pup. We'll check out that East Coast versus West Coast hot dog thing. Here, the standard dog automatically comes with chili on top. Where's my weenie? What do the Zen Buddhists say to the hot dog vendor? Make me one with everything? The ultimate experience. OK, I asked for the ultimate hot dog West Coast hot dog experience. Mm. Chili cheese dog with tomatoes. Crunchy. The squeaky and crunchy dog. The tail of the pup dog is good. The skin's a little thick to me, a little crunchy, but that seems to be a selling point out here. They're looking for a good snap, crackle, pop. Now, when stalking the elusive hot dog, I mean, I like to taste the hot dog itself, the, the essence of the dog proper. So I think next time around, we'll be, I'll be avoiding the chili or other adulterants. Pinks, by popular consensus, seems to be the apex of the L.A. dog maker's art. They've dreamed up hot dog toppings that we in New York wouldn't conceive of in our most fevered nightmares. To my mind, it's California at its best and at its worst. My guide through the hot dog kingdom at Pinks is appropriately enough, Gloria Pink. We're getting a sample, including something called the Millennium Dog. I believe there's guacamole involved which confirms, of course, my most deeply held prejudices and fears about this area. See, we finally encountered the avocado, and in close conjunction with a hot dog, too. Here we go. Here are some of our specialties. 
Gloria sets me up with a full tasting of some of their more classic and some of their more bizarre hot dog variations. Lovely. We've, we've got our Millennium Dog, which is the giant 12-inch jalapeno dog with guacamole and tomatoes and grilled onions and lettuce. We have our legendary chili cheese dog. The classic, right? The classic. We've got a bacon dog. And we've got a fajita dog. Cool. Does the hot dog snap when you bite into it? Yeah. This is really breaking the law. This is a complete rule breaker. This goes against everything I, I believe in. You want to call the waiter over, excuse me, waiter, there's guacamole on my hot dog. Awesome, but terrifying. God help me, I like it. This fits right in perfectly with my whole culinary philosophy, but you can never have too much pork. <laughs> <laughs> About an hour ago, I would have made a fervent argument that, that all hot dogs should essentially be this and, and no variation, but, but now my whole world has, has been changed. I feel a little bit ashamed. I'd be afraid to order or eat this in New York. I'm free to do it in California, as everybody seems to be eating weird hot dog variations. Once again, it's kind of good. It's overkill of the finest kind. That was a magnificent hot dog. It truly was. Crunchy, but not... Uh... Not troublingly crunchy. And then there's always a bridge too far. <laughs> okay. World famous Okie Dog. Oh man, I'm, I'm confused. What's the difference between an Okie Dog and a hot dog? Okay, it's got two hot dogs, pastrami, chili, and cheese wrapped in a flour tortilla. It's like a burrito. All right, I'll try that. That sounds strange. <laughs> This is really deranged. I regret that I have only one life to give to my network. What fiendish mind thought of this? Okie is right now serving 25 to life at the Terminal Island. Maybe next time I'll go for the teriyaki steak burrito. Something normal. I don't think I'll be uh, traveling down Okie Dog Road again. That's, uh, that took me right out of the game. The Okie Dog has shattered my newly found faith in California. You see, they lure you in, then wham them. They pull this crap. I wonder what other fiendish traps they've set. I think this is Beverly Hills. Oh, man. This, this is it. This is like... This is the heart of darkness. And the lawns are too green, the palm trees too high, the houses too nice. Don't look, Tony, don't look. I'm trying very hard not to picture myself as any one of these fine homes. You think the Beverly Hillbillies live there? All I need to do is discover some bubbling crude, and I can live here. The real reason I'm in LA is that I've been invited to be the guest chef at the Swank LA restaurant, Campanile. We're at Campanile restaurant with chef owner Mark Peel. I was worried about this. You're I've been ducking under range hoods my whole life. We're in the early planning and execution and prep stages of uh, tonight's special event here. How do you pronounce that one? Charcutai. Uh, Charcutai. We're doing an old school, very familiar French menu in which, believe it or not, I'm the guest of honor. I've been out of the kitchen way too long, uh, so this should be fun. Looking at this menu, it's like uh, sliding into oh, a nice, comfy, warm bath. <laughs> Nine hours to a uh, zero hour. Next, shopping. First, we head over to Mark's fish purveyor to pick up the fish for tonight. Look at the size of that guy. You see this? I like this place. It's not too weird. Giant clam legs, salwagami, monkfish liver. Yeah, deep fried sprinkle with uh, This place has got top of the line, ultra fresh stuff. I've seen most of this stuff before, and in a pinch, I could cook it. It's a perfect place to take refuge from the oaky eaters. This is the fish I was thinking about for us tonight. This is the uh, Spanish. Uh, Spanish Dorad, they're really nice, nice and fresh. We got the 36 of the Sea Bream, nine of those. We're looking for about 60 orders, so we're gonna have to get like a 20 of uh, Spanish snapper or something. Sp snapper is a very gray area. Basically, the entire fish business conspires to call anything that they can possibly call a snapper. Snapper. Everybody wants it, so of course they add the snapper name to anything they can that even barely resembles snapper, so that therefore they can get that top dollar for it and sell it. Oh, that's a pretty. Beautiful. It's from New Zealand, huh? Yeah, New Zealand. What is this called? Golden Eye. See, we call it Golden Eye Snapper. You could charge another buck a pound for it. <laughs> hey, he knows the game. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this is always my favorite job, right? Uh, oh, cleaning, yeah. cleaning the squids. We don't skin these. No? Fully. No. 
We, we, you know, we leave skin on. Okay. Um, and it comes out real good, real nice. Well, I got 16 pounds. Go for another four. More. The thought occurs to me that I haven't been in the kitchen for a long time now. And this being LA, who knows what unexpected disaster awaits me. Okay, we're gonna take that box, these two boxes, the red snapper, and the squid. These guys load for you, or uh, are we gonna haul? Beautiful. I'm, I'm notoriously uh, worst case scenario sort of a guy. Now, we bought, I believe, 60 pieces of fish. That's assuming then with 120 plus reservations, at least half will go for red meat. But there's a little voice in my head saying, you know, what if all of these communist, uh, non-red meat eater, uh, Hollywood types, what happens if everybody goes for the fish? What happens if they all go for the fish? Next stop on the tour, Santa Monica for some produce. Oh, I hope I see David Hasselhoff. The thing that's great about this market is that we can get all this stuff in New York. But here, it doesn't have to take the red eye, so it's that much fresher. So, Mark, you do this about once a week? You come here, what, every Wednesday? Every Wednesday, yeah. Oh, I love these. Look at this. Is this not sexy? Blood orange. But is that not cool? There's a hollandaise variation called Sauce Mal Maltese, made with blood orange juice. It's like a red hollandaise. Oh, so sexy. Oh, yeah, this is what chefs do. Now, that's oh, yeah. really that's sexy. we're talking about. Yes, we have tiny little baby fennel. That's great. We're just using for the uh, for the squid. Right. Oh, yeah. Oh, asparagus over here. So sexy. This place will put a fire in your loins. I'm thinking, uh, what, well, this is for the whole fish. Uh, but, you know, two spears of green, one spear of uh, a purple uh, per fish times, uh, what, 40? Yes. 60? Yeah, I like them. I like them big, but sometimes they get too big. I yeah. think that's a little too big. Yeah, that's a palm tree. Okay, that's it. We're off. This chef business has kept me from my convertible much too long, so I tell Mark I'll meet him back at the restaurant and head out in search of health food. I don't know why, but I'm susceptible to crafty and subtle advertising and promotional gimmicks. For some reason, I feel like a donut. Can I get uh, one glazed donut, one with uh, like a raspberry filled, and one of those uh, with the sprinkles on it in the end? Now, I like the French, kind of. But you know what I say? Can the French do this? <laughs> I don't think so. When you're standing in the shadow of the big donut, Every mouth falls magic. But you know the donut I've had so far? Just not big enough. Look at that. You know, my mother always told me never eat anything bigger than your head, but mom's been wrong about just about everything so far. What do you call that big monster donut? Do you have a name for it? The big one? Texas Glaze. Yeah. Right, everything's big in Texas. That's not false advertising. Mmm, intoxicating. Oh, I love this engine. God, I love this car. I'm already thinking, you know, what outrage would I not perform or commit to hang on to this fine piece of material? Holy Shore in Hamlet? Sure, I can write that. There's a battle for my soul going on right now. Time to head back to Campanile to make like a chef. I mean, a guest chef. But the smell of fresh bread lures me next door. Hi. Mark's wife, Nancy Silverton, started La Brea Bakery as part of Campanile back when they first opened. But now she's making bread for half the country. It smells really good in here, but you knew that already. What are you going to show me? Well, you know, I knew you were coming in, so I stayed up all night and I baked a few loaves of bread. What do you think? Oh, uh, man, that's a lot of work. I <laughs> formed all of, of these with your own hands. <laughs> Every single one. All right. This is our sourdough bag cut. And this one has fresh rosemary. And this has both Kalamata olives and Moroccan oil cured. This is a rye currant. Oh, that's really good. A good big, huh? big hunk of stinky cheese with this. I'm there. I wish I could bake bread. No, no, it's, it's way too late for me. It's a, it's a, it's a state of mind. In addition, While I'm chowing down on bread, the able staff of Campanile is busting their butts in the kitchen, trying to make me look good. As so, guest chef, I get to throw on my chef whites at the last minute and prance around like I have something to teach these guys. You can toss the order, stack, 
a little spoon or squeeze bottle action. With if it. I was them, I'd be thinking, how soon can we drag this miscreant into the alley and feed on his eyeballs? So I think I recognize the steely look in these guys' eyes as I instruct them on French fry uh, placement. Sack of fries on the, like at 12 o'clock. So my strategy is to stay the hell out of the way and let these guys do their job. Basically, this menu is very close to what we do at Leo. We specialize in old school, authentic brasserie bistro of the most rustic and heavy on the animal fat kind. It's classic bistro fare, Cote de Boeuf, which is a Flintstone sized piece of beef. You're not getting enough red meat out here. That's why, you know, it's not that same level of naked aggression and rage. Of course, if they don't want the beef, we're serving the roasted Dorad and Golden Eye Snapper we picked out at the market. I have no idea how Los Angelinos are going to like Leal Fair. My expectation is that they're all going to go for the fish. First course, a charcuterie plate. It's a terrine of veal and pork. It's sweetbreads. God, I love sweetbreads. A uh, little salami. It's clumbus. And serrano ham. The king of hams, by the way. Serrano is sort of the Spanish prosciutto. Uncooked, simply cured, not smoked, with just a touch of sweetness. So uh, the calamari salad. And the most critical, the French fries. We, we have problems when the oil's fresh, you know, when the oil's too clean, uh, when the potato's too wet. I mean, there's all sorts of magical uh, factors that work. Let's see how we do here. That's easy. Turning to my humble roots. I cook. Now, unlike the mosh pit in my kitchen in New York, this staff is about as polite and nice as any staff can be expected to be under these conditions. Were I the chef, I would have run my ass right out of this kitchen. How are people ordering their meat in general? Or is there a consensus here? We do real good. There is hope for humanity. On la benta. Yeah, I felt good. Take a picture. Oh, it is a picture. <laughs> then comes the most surreal part of the evening, where I get to swan around the dining room accepting compliments for all the fine work being done by other people in the kitchen and marveling at all the reasonable-looking customers who seem to have read my book and yet aren't running for the door at the first sight of me. Maybe they're just being polite. It's tough working in someone else's kitchen, but in this case, I'm not really working, so it's not that bad. It seems my expectations are unfounded. The yoga crowd likes the meat. They even like it a little bloody. Fries up. You're ready on that fish, right? You know you're in a professional kitchen when you can walk in, turn the whole menu upside down, and still get results like they've been doing it that way since day one. What's a trip to LA without a celebrity sighting? I'm lucky enough to meet Tony Shalhoub, star of the best restaurant movie ever, Big Night. Really, really pleased to meet you. Oh, pleasure. Brooke's been reading me from your book out loud. I, I have to tell you that this subject comes up a lot. Uh, with a bunch of chefs sitting around late at night, having way too many cocktails. Everybody universally agrees, the best restaurant movie ever. No American movie has ever gotten it right. I mean, the moves, the, the priorities, the, the look, it was, all, it was just dead on. I mean, you're a cult hero to chefs and cooks everywhere. Man. Great meeting you. <laughs> all in all, I'm impressed. I thought they'd all be crying for arugula and crusted tofu. They eat meat like heavyweights in training. They can't all be New York transplants. I really got to rethink this town. The evening of my guest chef gig is finally at an end. Happily, I've escaped without injury. So spectacularly went well, right? No, no senseless yeah. butchery, yeah. no violence, uh, happy customers. Where are we going now? Fred 62. Cool. The seduction is nearly complete. God, I love this car. It's going to break my heart giving up this car. But I want to die in this car. I want this car to be my funeral pyre. The burning wreckage of a 67 Mustang convertible. What more honorable way to die? Fat burger, boy, that looks good. I have nothing but beer, vodka, and cigarettes. Well, those are essential parts of any sensible person's diet, and not a lot of bulk there, not a lot of filler. So I'm looking for the greasiest, meatiest meal I could find. So this answers the question, what do chefs eat after work? Crap. <laughs> no, it's well, not crap. You know what I mean. But I mean, no. it's burgers. No squeeze bottles involved. 
No? Yeah. Oh, no, you're right. So maybe I made a ghastly mistake. It's not all bronze blonde bimbos and new age cultists feasting on alfalfa sprouts and wheatgrass juice. Yeah, sure, LA's still a surreal place. But I like the beach, I like the sun, and now I know I won't go hungry. I wonder what I'll miss most about New York. Yankee games at the stadium, or finding sushi at midnight. Yeah, it seems I had it wrong all these years. Or maybe that's just what they want me to believe. <laughs>